mountains to our west are comprised largely of ultramafic rock which contains significant amounts of chrome, nickel, and iron. Through the process of geologic weathering, these rocks form into what are called nickel laterite soils. They've developed a process to directly smelt this material into a low-grade stainless steel. We call it a stainless steel master metal because with additions of additional chrome units or nickel units, we can produce any type of stainless steel that the customer might require. My parents came to the Illinois Valley in 1939 and took up the claims that we're standing on now. I filed a plan of operation in 1992 and the Forest Service evaluated the uh, project over the course of nine years. During that time, they nominated Rough and Ready Creek, which is behind us, which is bone dry at this time of year, as a wild and scenic river. They, the Nature Conservancy hired a zoological company to try to find an O'Brien caddisfly to keep uh, the project from going forward. They ultimately issued a, an environmental impact statement that uh, outlined a number of options, which none of which were considered in my original plan of operation. What the Forest Service decided was that I would have to take 5,000 tons of the nickel laterite ore, fly it out of the mining area by helicopter, have it processed, and then submit the results of that processing to the Forest Service personnel, and they would determine whether or not it was economic. At that point, if they did make a positive determination, that would allow me to resubmit my plan of operation for further review after nine years of their having reviewed it to that point. We decided, and when I say we, I mean myself and my legal counsel, decided that the Forest Service had no intention of letting us go forward with the project, and we filed a, a, a Fifth Amendment takings case with the U.S. Court of Claims saying, the Forest Service is not intending to let us exercise our legal rights under the mining law, and as a consequence, they have taken our property. This went to the U.S. Court of Claims in 2001. In 2002, the U.S. Court of Claims remanded the case for evaluation to the BLM to determine what is called validity of these claims. Validity means would a person of ordinary prudence develop and continue to work and develop these claims. The uh, U.S. Bureau of Land Management did what is called a mineral examination. This mineral examination should have taken a maximum of six months. It in fact took three years and cost yet another million dollars. By adding costs and, and cutting the value of the ore, the Bureau of Land Management challenged the validity of my claims and took us to an administrative law court, which is operated by the Bureau of Land Management. The judge is, in fact, a Bureau of Land Management employee. After two years of legal wrangling and filing of briefs, the judge ruled against us based on a hypothetical price of metals and inflated costs. Even using his inflated costs and the real price of metals, we would have made a profit for the last 15 years. So we determined that we needed to file an appeal and we have done so. That appeal unfortunately goes to yet another administrative law court within the BLM. That's where things stand on the, the project as it is right now. And it's really unfortunate because with the economy the way it is today, it would be really a great thing if we could have some people working here. This is an important project. It's important for our community. The product is important for our society. And it's, uh, it's just a terrible shame that the federal government has elected to try to do everything in, in their power to stop the project from going forward to completion. There's two essential kinds of rock that we have to deal with. Round rock is rock that has already been worn in the environment by the rivers, by water resource, by air resource and is turned into a smooth exterior surface. That kind of rock and sand is what's used in the production of all of the concretes. So everybody's home, their foundations, the concrete blocks are all round rock resources. Those come from river-based sources. 
Then there are hard rock sources. Those are actively blasted from hillsides. Those larger rocks are then run through a crusher, sorted, and various products created that allow for predominantly roadway construction and the buildup of embankment. Aggregates are critically important in small geographic areas because they're bulky, they're heavy, they're hard to transport. So you have to have your aggregate sources close to your local economy. Aggregate production in Southern Oregon has gotten extremely difficult. And the permitting process takes now 14, 15, 16 months. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to permit a site because we have to complete noise studies and dust studies and transportation studies and, and evaluate the potential aggregate resources and so on. On one specific example, we had acquired some mineral rights from a gentleman by the name of Mr. Krause. It's a Jackson County site, it's reasonably close. It would have the ability to be able to get aggregates, round rock aggregates, into our local economy at a fairly reasonable cost. We began the permitting process some seven years ago. By the time we completed the land use process and applied for all of the necessary public permits from the mining regulatory agencies, we we're over a half a million dollars into the cost of the site. And we have not, at this date, been able to receive a permit for the site. We've been mining on the Applegate River for 30 years. That river is beautiful today because at the close of our projects, we do restoration work. We assure that what we have done has not had a, a major adverse impact to the environment. We have a very limited resource, predominantly because of the problems in the permitting process and land use and the environmental issues that associate with our industry. We believe those can all be effectively mitigated and that we are a great corporate and um, and personal citizen living in your environment, we're hopeful that people will recognize that we're trying to do the right thing to create a viable local economy. This is the site of the first gold discovery in Oregon. In its day, millions of dollars worth of gold came out of this little creek alone. The Illinois River itself was loaded with placer gold. Over the years, Hundreds, if not thousands, of prospectors and miners worked this area alone. Almost every rock in sight has been moved by miners. All of these trees have grown back since the heyday of mining occurred in this area in about, about 1850 to 1860s. This shows that even the tremendous amount of mining doesn't necessarily leave a permanent scar. Load gold is your typical underground type deposit. The gold is still locked up in the rock that it formed in. So typically you would mine that by going underground, digging tunnels, sinking shafts, things of that nature. Placer mining, which was the most popular method of mining in Josephine County, is any kind of gold deposit other than a load. So it basically means if a load deposit erodes due to weathering, landslides, earthquakes, glaciers, anything like that, that load deposit that, if it's exposed on the surface, when it erodes away, as soon as the gold moves away from the vein, it is considered placer. And over eons of time, that gold, because it's so heavy, will slowly work its way down the side of the mountain, and eventually it will get into a stream. Suction dredging has been shown to be the most economically effective method of mining those kinds of, of deposits and also the most environmentally friendly method of mining those deposits. The dredge adds absolutely nothing to the water that wasn't already in the water. No chemicals are used, there's no special processing, we're not grinding the ore up into dust, we're not doing anything, we're just sucking the material up, running it through a gravity sluice box, and the gold settles out just by its weight alone, and the rest of the material basically falls back into the waterway from where it came from. Starting in the 1990s, a local environmental group in this area filed a lawsuit against the Siskiyou National Forest for failure to require a plan of operations for suction dredge operations. 
The Forest Service mining regulations spells out when a plan of operations is required. And it's basically only required if you're building a road, cutting trees, or using heavy earth moving equipment such as a bulldozer or a backhoe. The other time a plan of operations could be required is if you are likely to cause a significant surface disturbance. Because the suction dredge operates solely in the water, the disturbance is subsurface, it's underwater, and even more importantly, it's not significant. All it takes is one winter high water flow event and it will naturally erase all sign that the suction dredging ever took place. This day and age, if you submit a plan of operations for approval, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management claim that that triggers the National Environmental Protection Act, or NEPA. NEPA requires, before the government agencies can make any decision whatsoever, they must first do either an environmental analysis or a full-blown environmental impact statement. Either one of these can take years to do. The Forest Service allowed the, the environmental organization to basically say almost anything they wanted to in court and they didn't dispute any of it. It was all based on the 1994 Northwest Spotted Owl Forest Plan, where basically everybody thinks that was a timber management plan, and it was. It's books this thick, but on half of one page, it dealt with mining. And what it basically said, they had this, well, it's called Minerals Management One, or MM1, and it basically said any mining operation within a riparian reserve, which is basically anywhere near water, will be required to have an approved plan of operations, a reclamation plan, and a bond. Well, when the Forest Service lost their, the lawsuit against them, they didn't even bother to appeal it. Instead, they came to a, the May meeting in 2000 of the Waldo Mining District and told area miners that from now on, we would need plans of operation before we could run a suction dredge knowing full well that they had not approved a single plan of operations in the Siskiyou National Forest for over 10 years. The local environmental organization that started all of this filed a third lawsuit in, uh, I believe it was February of 2003. The suit took over six years. It went through magistrate court, U.S. District Court, and then it was appealed to the U.S. Ninth Circuit. It was held on a hearing on February, I believe, 2nd, 2008, and the decision just came out this year in, I believe it was March of 2009, and the decision was that MM1, or Minerals Management 1, of the Northwest Forest Plan could not be used to require plans of operation for mining activities unless those activities would need a plan of operations under the Forest Service mining regulations anyway. So where we stand today is thousands and thousands of dollars have been spent in legal fees. Uh, all it would have taken in the earliest suits was for the Forest Service to have raised their hand in court and said, but your honor, on page one of the Northwest Forest Plan, it plainly states that nothing in the Northwest Forest Plan supersedes existing law or regulation or gives the agency authority they don't already have. Nobody brought that up and it took almost 10 years to fight this.